This week's podcast is sponsored by our friends at Audible. Listening to Audible is a great way to experience a story and make the mundane moments in your day, like driving, commuting or exercising, more interesting. Sign up at audible.co.uk forward slash AVF for a 30-day trial and your first audiobook is free. This week they're recommending The Monster Collection, three gothic classics in one audiobook. Get ready for Halloween with eerie performances of Dracula, Frankenstein and The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Sign up for your 30-day trial at audible.co.uk forward slash AVF. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 30th of October. It's the end of the month, people. And assistant editor Steve Withers is here. This is the most fun I've had without lubricant. And audio reviewer Ed Selly. I went to bed in my shithole apartment and I woke up in an actual shithole. Uh, welcome back to the podcast. There's no marks yet again. Obviously, uh, October is a bad month if your name is Mark and you need to make it to a podcast. They, they didn't make it this month, did they? Was there anybody on the beginning of the October podcast i can't remember now no, no, those, those work shy buggers have missed both the whole yeah. month. <laughs> i kind i kind of thought that might be the case there and uh only managed to go twice to the cinema i am disappointed with myself i really am this month you're still in the black though aren't you after two visits i think uh yes. yeah plus I, I there's the whole star wars debacle but we won't go there just again. yet again uh <laughs> ed how's the uncle getting there uh i did pick up an infection in the operation scar so for a couple of days i had an actual functioning halloween prop attached to my leg oh, I love that. um uh but i'm on, on antibiotics now and it's clearing up and i'm continuing to make reasonable progress so thank you yeah we're getting there i shall be able to uh, pimp walk my way around vegas like a good one. yeah and uh, apologies if you are eating a meal at this moment in time while listening to that i didn't say exactly why i look like a functioning halloween prop <laughs> I can, but <laughs> no. Let's let's not go there. Uh, Steve, you having issues? No, I'm fine, thank you. Beyond <laughs> the <laughs> usual, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Old age, obviously. But, uh, apart from that, it's all good. Everybody well, I, I understand we've had our first Blu-ray UHD Blu-ray player that's actually tampering with the sig- signal, and we're having to further investigate this one. Yes, it does seem as though uh, a certain player. Do you want me to tell so I mention it, or should we save that for later? <laughs> well, we'll save that for the dear, dear reader to read it themselves. Yeah. Um, but, yes, um, as we've mentioned on numerous podcasts, the ideal player should just take what's on the disc and put it out to the TV or project or whatever the display is. You know, just take those ones and zeros from the disc and output them unmolested. That's what the player is supposed to do. We don't want players doing things to the signal. Or if they do have modes, and some players do have modes that do things to the signal, they need to have at least one mode that does nothing to the signal and just outputs what's on the damn disc. We don't want people <laughs> calibrating the players so that they can output what's on the disc in a in a form that they think is appropriate. There are industry yeah. standards here, and that's why they exist, and that's what I want the player to do. And if it isn't doing that, it's going to get a shoeing. <laughs> and and so and so it should because it's uh you know it's not up to a manufacturer to decide what a film should look like. That's down to the director and the exactly, person yeah, grading it and, not, and all the rest of it and the you know, the director of photography and, you know, they spend uh, a long time uh, working on these things and uh, it's not up to a manufacturer to change that. So, naughty, naughty. We'll, we'll do a further investigation. We will put it to them. We'll speak to their engineers and we'll see uh, why uh, and what the thinking is behind it. And like Steve says, if that is the way that they're going to release the product, we can't possibly recommend anything like that. And, you know, nine and a half times out of ten, the testing that we do and all the rest, it just verifies that things are working properly but it's a good job that we do test these things thoroughly because uh, I have no doubt that that would uh, bypass quite a few reviewers who do not take the time uh, to run the proper tests and measure things and all the rest of it so uh, naughty naughty to that manufacturer right. let's see if we can get them to change their ways a little bit right uh, current competitions Ed what can we win uh, there is a single competition, but it is a doozy. You can win a Focal Sib Evo 5.1.2 Dolby Atmos speaker package worth £1,099, courtesy of Seven Oaks Sound and Vision. And the competition closes on the 1st of November. So we'll get get your skates on when yeah. this podcast comes yeah, out. Yeah, you better be quick. That's Wednesday, people, if you're listening on a Monday. If you're listening on um, a Tuesday, it's tomorrow. If you're listening on Wednesday, it's today. If you're listening on Thursday, <laughs> tough luck. <laughs> but I've, I've listened to that speaker package i've had a demonstration of it and it's bloody good so that's a cracking prize well worth it so get stuck in okay there's one more competition by the way which Stuart has just put up 
which is you can win a copy of Batman versus Two Face on DVD, and that competition runs until the eighth uh, of November. Um, this is the last um, thing that Adam West did as Batman. He is uh, animated, but it's animated in the style of the sixty TV show, and he he did the voice for Batman just before he died. So um, well, William Hank, Shatner's Hank, in that as well, isn't it? Yeah, William Shatner is playing Two Face. So actually. Uh, that sounds like a really good bribe. <laughs> that yeah. has actually suddenly crept up from, oh, to, ooh. <laughs> yeah. So, so there you go. Breaking competition news as we record the podcast. Never had On that happen the before. leading edge. Are, aren't we always not? Right. And uh, previous competition winners? Uh, once again, it was a triumph for none. Okay. Well done to none. Uh, moving on to hardware news, and uh, lo and behold, we've got another TV review, Steve. Yeah, yeah, we have um, another one from Hisense. In fact, we've seen their entry level uh, Ultra HD 4K TV, which is the N6800, and now we've got their mid range model, which is the NU8700. This is uh, Edge Edgelit, Edgelit LED uh, LCD TV. And uh, I've got to say, I was quite impressed by it. Now, I've got one thing I will point out right at the beginning is that it's a bit more expensive than some of the other Hisense TVs that we've seen. So I think it's £1,600 for a 65... But this is for a 65-inch TV, so still a pretty good price for a 65-inch TV. But obviously, you know, £1,600 is a reasonable amount of money, money, and you, there are a lot more alternatives at that price point in terms of the competition. But for a 65-inch screen size, that's still a pretty good price. And... Uh, I've got to say, I was impressed by the TV. Most of all, I was impressed by the fact that out of the box, it was very accurate. And this is this is key, I think, particularly when you're starting to go down the price scale, that the TVs can deliver a good performance out of the box because, you know, the chances are people may not get it calibrated. They probably won't get it calibrated because you're paying, um, you know, two, three hundred pounds for calibration. That's a large percentage of what you've just spent on the TV. So the bigger that percentage is, the less likely they are to actually get it calibrated. And therefore, it's important that the TV can deliver a good performance out of the box. And we obviously have seen over the last couple of years that that has been getting better and better for manufacturers. And the out of the box performance has been getting more and more accurate uh, to the industry standards, which we were talking about a few minutes ago. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the Hisense NU8700 did exactly that in terms of its um, SDR, so standard dynamic range performance, uh, against Rec. 709 and D65. It was very accurate. You could calibrate it, but in factual fact, calibrating it would have made very little perceivable difference because the errors were already below the visible threshold of three. So uh, I was very pleased with that. I thought that's excellent. Um, it wasn't quite as accurate in terms of HDR, and this is an interesting area because obviously we've been talking about HDR now for a couple of years, but it's still uh, an area that's being developed. So things like tone mapping are very much down to individual manufacturers, how they tone map. I've got to say, this TV tone mapped really well. Using a 10,000 nit test pattern, it tone mapped it accurately to its native um, brightness, which in the case of this TV was around I think it was 500 nits. So it's not that, I mean, when this TV was announced, they were talking about ultra HD premium certification, which would mean a, a minimum of 1,000 nits of peak brightness. But in actual fact, it was way off that, which is, I guess, why it isn't ultra HD premium certified. It did deliver enough of DCI-P3, over 90% DCI-P3, so that would have been sufficient. It can accept a 10-bit signal, although it isn't a 10-bit panel. It's an 8-bit plus 2 dither. But in terms of its peak brightness, it isn't that bright. Um, but it does tone map accurately. So in actual fact, I mean, that's a good thing because it means that although you may not be getting the 1,000 nits of peak brightness, you are at least seeing what you're meant to be seeing correctly and it's not clipping any of the details. So that's good news. Uh, color accuracy could have been better as well. So again, with the Ultra HD Premium Certification Program, it, it says you have to reach a certain percentage of, of DCI P3, but it doesn't specify how accurate you have to be in terms of tracking the saturation points. And so, you know, there's a lot of variables, again, between manufacturers and models in terms of that. So the SDR performance was very accurate out of the box. The HDR performance wasn't quite as good out of the box. But as I say, the tone mapping was good. And so you actually did get a quite um, a decent HDR performance, ultimately, even though it does have certain limitations. Design-wise, um, it's, it's very reminiscent of Samsung, I have to say. It looks a lot like a Samsung TV. It's got a kind of flying V-stand, which is nice to see. Well, actually, it's, it, it looks identical to the KS9500 that I have here. I yeah, was ed yeah, editing your video <laughs> yesterday, and I thought, ooh, that's the same stand. Yeah, it's, it's definitely reminiscent. And, and also, um, it's got a similar feel to this year's TVs there, um, Q series, the QLED series, with um, this being quite a narrow edge-lit TV, uh, brush black metal, um, um, black brush metal rear panel um, with a wider bit at the bottom where obviously the speakers and electronics are. Um, so yes, it, it does look very similar to a Samsung. And not a bad thing. I think Samsung's design teams are, are very good and, and their TVs often look very attractive. It's a good-looking television. It's well-made. Um 
It's got, I like the remote control. Uh, uh, yeah, and the platform, the smart platform is uh, simple but effective. It has what you want. It's got Netflix and Amazon and BBC iPlayer and the catch-up services and Freeview Play as well. So, you know, I've got no complaints, really. I think uh, I think it's a good, solid TV, a good performer all around. It is up to, there is a lot of competition, as I say, at that price point. You can get TVs from Samsung, for example, for less uh, or slightly more. Um, so that basically it sort of sits between the... The Samsung, uh, I think it's the MU6400 and the MU7000. So it sits between those two TVs in terms of price point. Uh, but uh, I'd say overall it, it, it held its own against the Samsungs and I thought it was a really solid performer and certainly worthy of recommendation. Okay, good stuff. And if you want to read that review, it will be probably up by the time you listen to this podcast. If not, it will be within a day of you listening to the podcast. Um, right, so it's the end of the month which means we've got a new month coming up and uh, as we get closer to the festive season we're not really bothered about the festive season at CES that we're bothered about but um, as we get closer to that we're whittling down the amount of stuff that we're having through but as the dark nights come in Steve this is the perfect time to be watching projectors and lo and behold this is the time of year where manufacturers are starting to release their projectors so you've had a look at the Sony uh, VW 260 I've got the VW 360 we discussed it last week on the podcast and lo and behold this week uh, you've had JVC's X5900 delivered and I've had the X7900 uh, delivered and uh, opened the box and my first words were oh for f**k's sake and it was white wasn't it <laughs> it was white <laughs> And uh, I, I have a, I really have a thing about white projectors. I, they're great for filming. Don't get me wrong. So if you yeah, make, you doing that, a, I was this is going to be a lot easier to film than a black when, one in a black room. Yeah, if you're trying to film something as black within a black room, and you're trying to be fancy with minimal lighting, um, it makes it really difficult. Whereas if it's white, it's quite good. But actually, having spent all of an hour with it and having a good look at it. I've got to say, I really quite, I'm starting to like the white and black effect, especially the fact that, you know, you've got the 5900, which doesn't have the uh, the lens door. This does, and it's black. And the black set against the white, it, it's actually starting to grow on me quite a bit. And uh, the lettering's in, in like a silver, a matte silver, yeah. and it's like a matte white finish. So actually, <laughs> from the initial opening the box and thinking, oh, Christ, it's a, it's a white projector in a black room, I'm actually starting to really quite, to quite dig the design now. <laughs> <laughs> it's also glossy, isn't it? It's a nice glossy white. No, no, this is matte white. Is it matte? Oh, yeah. I, I thought the because the the five nine hundreds matte, but I thought the seven nine hundred was a, a glossy finish. No, no, it's like a matte white finish, yeah, which, which is why I really quite like it. And like so, I say, it's the back, the rear of the panel is black, isn't it? Yeah, the connections up. Yeah, it's quite so, nice too. Quite so like that that, that's what I'm saying. It's the white on black effect. I really quite like it, and and because it's got the lens door as well, which is black. It looks really, really quite good. Um, so yeah, so uh, Stranger Things two is is now available on Netflix as we record this. I haven't had a chance to have a look at it yet, uh, but this weekend will be spent with the Sony and the JVC fighting it out to see, um, you know, is is it worth the money for a native four K projector or is there more to an image? I think that our listeners know the answer to that one because we've been banging on about it for weeks. But um, this weekend will be spent. I'll probably watch Stranger Things two twice. Well, it is Stranger Things 2, isn't it? So you've got to watch it It twice. is Stranger Things 2. It's nine episodes, so you're looking at about uh, nine hours times two. Yeah, you can do that easily. <laughs> In a weekend, yeah, that's, that's a normal working day for me, Steve. <laughs> what, 18 hours? Yeah, normally. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to alternate. So I'll, I'll do some of it on the projector and some of it on the B7 because it's Dolby Vision as well. So, uh, But I want to listen to the sound design in the uh, in the home cinema. So there'll be a bit of alternating for me. I've already started seeing it, watching it, but... Uh, just watch yeah, it twice. It. You, you're the person that's got all this time to watch TV. When we come on to the TV section of this, it's unbelievable how much you've watched this week. I, I'm, <laughs> I think you're having me on with time-wise when you say, oh, I'm stretched. I can't, I can't fit any more in. <laughs> no, you can't fit any more in because you're sitting watching TV programmes. Uh, Ed, choose your best budget bookshelf speakers, mate. Well, uh, I've done just that. Uh, it's gone up. Uh, on the Friday as we record this. Um, now, I'm sure that at least someone's going to say, mm, budget. This actually goes from £190, which is the cheapest stereo pair of loudspeakers that we've looked at, which ironically is one of the very best pairs of loudspeakers we've looked at in the form of the Mission LX2 and goes up to £600. Now, for a, load, a number of people, you're going to say, don't be ridiculous, £600 is not in any way, shape or form a budget loudspeaker. But Money is subjective. That's what people keep telling me anyway. So these are these are the products that we've looked at, which 
we feel are you know are ones that have uh, stood up and over the course of this year and there's some slightly older ones in there as well are the ones that you you need to consider when when shopping around at this price point uh, the most recent uh, arrival on the list is the kef q350 which obviously went through uh, very recently um they still up on the front page but that's joined by uh two q acoustics offerings um the acoustic energy a100 which we looked at a couple of months ago and uh, the mission that we've mentioned as well, and Wharfdale get in on the list as well. Uh, it's worth pointing out that in terms of their raw performance, all of these loudspeakers are ridiculously good. Obviously, you know, they're mechanical items. More money buys better engineering, buys better materials, and so on and so forth. But I can remember at the start of this year uh, reviewing the Mission LX2 and just thinking this is really re- very good indeed for, for a £400 speaker. And then I realised at that point that it cost 160 quid. They are, I mean, the level of performance, I mean, often this crops up as a forum topic. Are things genuinely getting better? I can honestly say in the context of these products here, yes, they are. Um, improvements in production pro- processes, certain materials creeping in, and certain certain designers. I mean, that one designer is responsible for uh, three of the speakers on that list. And um, just the expertise that they're bringing in is producing some absolutely outstanding products. So have a look at the list. Please feel free to, you know, comment on it and see, say if there's a particular one that you, you know, would like to see see us have a look at in the, in the not-too-distant future and so on and so forth. And, and yeah, hopefully it is a resource of some use to anyone hope, looking to buy a pair of stereo loudspeakers for a sensible sum of money. Yeah, I mean, that should be on the, on the homepage when you listen to this podcast, unless you listen to this podcast three months from when it was published. Yeah. Um, it won't be there anymore. Uh, but but the search function In which will. case, good yeah. luck finding it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's one of our Best Buy articles, and they're nice and easy to find because all you need to do is uh, just go to the menu at the top of the page and click on Best Buy, and mm-hmm. that'll bring up all our Best Buy articles. So if, if it's not speakers you're interested in, you want to know our Best Buy TVs, they're there. You want to know our Best Buy OLEDs, are there just click on uh, best buy uh, in the menu on the on any page on av forums it's up the top just go ha- have a look uh, right so uh, that's ed's budget bookshelf speakers uh, we were going to have mark's game of the month uh, mark's not here have you played any games steve uh have i no one only only the games i play when testing tvs but they're not new games so they don't really count i don't think okay so we can't although i tell you what i'm looking forward to it's coming out soon isn't it? star wars battlefront 2 looks oh, quite jesus tasty. most star yeah. wars <laughs> well, I, I'd like to steer away. I had a brief go on a game called Cuphead. Um, now, oh, yeah, after Mark, that, wasn't it? after a brief, you know, fifteen-year hiatus from playing games of that nature, I'd like to stress that I was completely shit. But what a beautiful thing as a piece of art and just as a, a creation and the vision that's gone into it. What a game! And also, I, as I understand it, I'm well out of the loop on this, but. It's quite unusual in so much as you pay a sum of money and you get the whole game. There's no downloadable content or bolt-on extras or any crap like that. You get it and you play it like you used to in the good old days. And it's fab. It just looks astonishing. Is this the so, one that looks like a 1930s cartoon? Yes. Yes. It's just... I mean, I I was blown away by how it looked. I was, I, I mean, I wasn't, I'm not going to pretend for a second I was trying to run it on my own laptop. I went over to a friend who's got uh, a more sort of seri- a serious piece of equipment for that sort of undertaking. But it just looks incredible. And um, yeah, I think that people should be thoroughly saluted for making stuff like that. You know, a self-contained, cracking, single or two-player game. That, and it just, as you say, it looks like nothing else I've seen uh, really, really good. So I'm not bot right. You know, he's busy. We were discussing this yesterday. He, he was talking about laying foundations. We don't know if he's constipated or something like that. But he, he's he's off doing. He's off possibly doing a the, euphemism. Possibly a poo metaphor. We don't know. But um, that, as I say, I looked at that and it looked incredible. So yeah, I like Cuphead. Go me. Okay. Good stuff. So, like you say, we've got the two projectors coming in uh, for November, which we're reviewing the two JVCs. Um, I've also got the BenQ W1050, which is a £599 1080p projector. Um, so, it's also short, short throw. So, if it's something that you're looking for big sports or gaming and that kind of thing, um, then that might suit you rather than you know these uh, high-end home cinema projectors from JVC. Uh, what else do you have coming up this month, Steve? I uh, got the Denon uh, AVR X4 400 uh, AV receiver, 
got the Sony uh, XE85 LED LCD TV. And um, next week, I'll be getting the, uh, much for, uh, due to popular demand on AV forums, we'll be getting in the Panasonic uh, EX750. There's too many E's and X's in these. these yeah, we're, uh, we're, we haven't even gotten on to the Yamaha stuff yet. So we also got some <laughs> Yamaha stuff turning up mid-month. Um, so I'm going to have a look at the flagship a30 is it, are we up to 70 now a30 oh, yeah, 70. 70 yeah uh so i have that coming in i've got the a30 50 and also looked at the a30 60 last year so oh, yeah uh, uh, I, i'm I'll sure be it'll be the, i'm sure it'll be exactly the same <laughs> <laughs> i'll be getting the a, a870 isn't it i think as well yeah um, okay so yeah. so we've got some yamaha stuff coming in as well and um i think that's it for me for the rest of the year because i'm gonna have a pile of videos and some interesting articles uh, before we get to the end of the year to uh, to be working on. Uh, Ed, what have you got lined up for November? We've got the Cord Electronics Poly. This is the Mojo Bolt-On that was launched last week. Um, that will be got out in... We'll try and get that through as quickly as we can. Um, very, very interesting product, this. I don't want to say too much about it at this point, but it it's... I can't work out at the moment whether it's the cleverest thing I've I've ever seen, or something that I I don't hundred percent know what what it's supposed to do. Um, so I'm hoping over the course of the weekend I'll get to the bottom of that conundrum and we'll work it out from there. Um, mentioned it briefly last week. We've got a Kef Q series package, uh, including Atmos capability, uh, five point one point four going through. Uh, monitor audio, uh, and we've got the Silver 100, so we're going to see if that can uh, keep the, take the fight to the KEF Q350. Uh, NAD have sent an, in, an integrated amplifier that does many, many interesting things. And because I was getting withdrawal symptoms, we're also having a look at a turntable, which is so good, they named it after a Persian king. I don't want to say any more than that. Some people will know what I mean by by, by that reference, and others you'll just have to wait until the review. If but, they've seen the film 300, they'll know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, but then it's also referencing the turntable. So, but, no, but yeah. I'm just saying, they'll know the but, Persian king. As I say, it's the most it's it's the most expensive turntable we've ever looked at for AV4. So it's got loads of piercings, has it? Um, so yes, is it a 12-foot ladyboy? <laughs> it, does actually, it, like? it, it does actually have an, in, in, an inexplicable hole. But... but um, <laughs> Uh, otherwise, it's it's largely free of adornment. It, in fact, it's 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 gorgeous. So um, whether that makes it a twelve foot lady boy, I, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I'm going to try and do do justice to it with photography a little later on today. In fact, because uh, it's a lovely sunny day, so I'm going to make use of that in the conservatory. See what I can do. Um, but no, I've been having a whale of a time with this. It's one of those things where mm, I need to spin the review of this how, out for as long as I possibly can. How do you have a whale of a time with? A turntable. It only does one thing, Ed. Yeah, it's that. That's the whole point, though. It does one thing sensationally well. Let's be clear about this. It's just uh, I, I, I'm going to have to dig out, dig out new and exciting um, superlatives for the review on this one. But you know, that's that's my joy as a writer. I've it's okay. Just just I, don't don't use the term insight. Whatever you do. No, I know, I know. That's that. That you know. At one, at one point, I, I I can't remember which review it was. A couple of, in, in the in recent history, where I actually had to use insight in the correct context, and I still held off until the last minute from actually using it because I know that you've got <laughs> such a thing about it. It's like, but no, actually, insight is the correct word there. So no, I'm going with it, and I it didn't get edited out. So closely yeah. followed by the word authority. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, fair enough. <laughs> you know, it's all all right. You you know, you you guys just thump up the graph and goes, yeah, it met the graph or it didn't meet the graph. Uh, you know, but I'm sure we're all waiting with bated breath for that one, Ed. Uh, right. So your album vinyl release and playlist of the month is uh, right. Album is uh, one that completely blindsided me. I had no prior real prior exist uh, knowledge of the existence of this band, and as I understand it, this is about their eighth or ninth album. But um, I, once again, you know, streaming services to the rescue, I was looking through albums released and there was one with a beautiful cover. And, you know, because I'm shallow, I thought, oh, let's have a look at the one with the beautiful cover. And it's a Canadian band called Stars. And the album's called the, uh, There Is No Love Under Fluorescent Light. And it's just lovely. And the reason it's my album of the month is it's not getting a huge release in Europe so it's really something that you want to look at through streaming services and and, and so on and so forth because 
I'm an idiot and I've I've got the 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 vinyl record coming in from Canada, but I'm not suggesting that that's a, 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 exactly the path that sane people should take. How so much is that costing you? <laughs> it's costing some money. <laughs> let's leave it at that especially as i've ticked to go for the limited edition one in ivory rather than the black record so i'm an idiot it's this is my is version it, uh, of steel books is it one tank of fuel or two tanks uh it's three quarters of a fiesta tank so yeah let's leave it at that so not it's not unmanageable but it's still pretty stupid um vinyl release of the month is something you can buy in the uk um, and I do think it benefits from being on vinyl. Is an artist called St. Vincent. Uh, she has, she's, uh, if you like, uh, a sort of hybrid of a number of different performers. And her albums have always shown progression. They, then no two album is, ex- it's not exactly the same as the one that's before. But her new album is called Mass Seduction. And uh, it's a really good listen. You can have it, find it on all of the us- in the, all the usual places. But the uh, vinyl release is uh, bright pink, and the artwork is uh, going to on the cover is going to you know be momentarily arresting for uh, people gentlemen of a heterosexual persuasion. So you know why not go for that on as the as the uh, as the vinyl choice? Although it's a damn good listen on across all formats. And then playlist. I'm hoping this one might be a bit more up your alley, gentlemen, because. If you have a look on Tidal, you will find that they have uh, taken all of the songs from Netflix's Mindhunter series and uh, stitched them all together into some quality late 70s uh, musical action. I was listening to it yesterday and I was having a great time with it. It's a really, really good sound. It's a really good playlist. So I would get stuck into that with with some vigour. And your friendly and regular reminder that you can access this soundtrack um, via the URL that I believe you can access without being a a signed up member to Tidal. And you can use Soundiz to pop it across to whichever um streaming service you happen to be using so whilst the recommendation is for this particular service you can listen to it by porting it across to whichever streaming service you happen to use okay thanks for that ed so that's uh, the month all wrapped up so only thing we need to mention now is that at the time uh, you probably listen to this podcast as it goes out uh, the week um there's a new iphone coming at the end of the week it's the iPhone X or 10, however you want to call it. Um, we discussed this when it was announced. Have we changed our minds? Because all three of us said, nah. Um, have we now changed our minds now that this phone is going to be available? Are we going to go and get one? Steve, you're, you're the most likely, seeing as you're a, a fanboy. Uh, no. Um, partly because my contract runs until February of 2019. Um, but also because uh, I don't really need it. And it's very expensive. <laughs> Ed? I'm happy with the iPhone 7. Um, I, ironically, am resigned to the fact that I probably need to get myself a new phone before I disappear off to CES. But no, I, there's simply no way on earth I'm spending that much money on a telephone. Um, yeah. It's just, it's. I'm sure that it's very, very good. I'm sure that it, it, it and also does the classic Apple... Um, you know, trick that they've got down to a, a perfect art of instilling enormous owner owner satisfaction. But it's more money than I'm, you know, I'm prepared to spend on such a device, especially as, you know, sooner or later my son will drop it a couple of hundred times and it will <laughs> it will die. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that's the other consideration. I think here. I'm the only one that's, that's just about to come out of contract again. Um, uh, I didn't renew my phone last time I went on a SIM-only contract. It'll be coming up for renewal in the next few months, I think. Um, no, I'm I'm going to stick with my iPhone six and just renew my SIM only uh, deal, and hopefully get Spotify for free again for a year. Um, I I don't know what it is, but I think we've we've reached a point with Apple now where um, it's no longer a revolutionary product. Well, it, it wasn't really after the first one, was it really? But um, you know, it's it, it's got to a point now where where from probably the five onwards they all look the same. And and that's yeah. that's the problem uh, for me. That there needs to be a, a a bit of a rethink. And and it's not only the iPhones that all look the same. Just look at any handset that's out at the minute, and um, they all almost look identical. Um, so so there's not much innovation going on at the minute. So you know I'm happy with my six. It still does everything it's supposed to do and still charges up. But if you are interested, our review should be live when Steve. 
Wednesday. Night. Wednesday, and it's David Feeling that's doing our review for us, and David's had the phone for quite a while now. Uh, and David's had this phone for at least a week, so he has had time uh, to play, to really play about with it, and uh, you know, he'll be giving his thoughts on Wednesday. So if you are interested in the iPhone X or the iPhone X, then look out for the review. It's coming up on Wednesday, and uh, it should be interesting to see what David thinks, because uh, he's, like I say, he's had quite some time to play around with it. Right, so that's hardware news done. Over to movie news next. Okay, so moving on to movie news and uh, movie reviews, because we have been at the cinema, like we said back at the start, it had been twice this month, so I've seen Blade Runner 2049, and I also went and saw Thor Ragnarok, and um, I, I, I will openly up front say this is the first Thor movie I've actually seen, so I haven't seen the other two. I'm not a big comic book fan, as you know, I'm not really into Marvel stuff, like the Avengers and so on, as, as you all know if you listen to this podcast regularly. It was a full screening... And I went in with pretty mediocre expectations, to be honest with you. It's, uh, to me, it was going to pass an hour and a half, basically. And I've got to say, where we've complained in the past with Blade Runner and a few other films recently about pacing and about being a bit overly self-indulgent and long and all the rest of it, it was actually quite refreshing to go into a movie that didn't outstay its welcome. It did its thing, it told its story quickly, and it wrapped up nicely pretty quickly. Uh, and it seemed to go over nice and quickly, and um, I was thankful of that. Now, that's not to say that I hated this film. I didn't hate this film. Hate's a very strong word. I, but at the same time, I did not love it the way that Kaz loved it. I read Kaz's review after I'd seen it, and Kaz is obviously a fanboy, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. He obviously is a, a fan of Marvel uh, and this type of movie. So I'm kind of in the middle with this one. It was enjoyable. I didn't really understand some elements of the story because I haven't seen the previous two movies. So uh, in terms of relationships between the brothers, I wasn't really sure where that was because I, I, I didn't have any prior experience of that. But having said that, it didn't it didn't um, spoil the movie for me in any way. I, the, the way I describe it is it had Gardens of the Galaxy sensibilities and humour mixed with some interest in action, but also some massive, massive plot holes. I mean, even bigger than the ones that you discussed last week off air, Ed, uh, Blade Runner. This one, it's like, eh, that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But at the same time, it's one of these films that, um, you know, fans are going to love it. Fans of Marvel and, and, and so on are going to go and see it anyway. They're going to love it. They're going to give it high scores. And those of us who are, are not into you know, the whole franchise thing, it's it's an enjoyable hour and a bit. Um, it doesn't outstay its welcome. There are some genuinely funny moments in there. There's some laugh out loud things. I saw it with a with a full cinema, full screening, and it was a it was a real mixture from kids, probably about seven or eight year old upwards, and and adults and fanboys and geeks. It was enjoyable with a full cinema because everybody laughed at the right minutes and so on. And and there's one c- comedic character in there who, I would love to see a film of, of his uh, as 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 an addition to the franchise. I thought it was brilliant, but yeah, mm, I'd probably give it a seven out of ten. Yeah, yeah, I think Kaz's nine was probably a bit generous. I'd probably go an eight because I've got more invested in it than you have, Phil. I haven't seen all the Marvel films, obviously being familiar with Thor 1 and Thor 2, or Thor The Dark World. Um, I should say that this this film tonally is very different from the two other Thor movies. I mean, they they were, I think you could accuse them of being a little bit pompous and morose. Shakespearean. Utterly yeah, I mean, morose. Thor is inherently a silly character, and I think uh, they've realised that, and and hence gone for a very different take with the, this film, which is which is much more, like you say, like... like Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, it's it's set in space. It's it's got spaceships and it's it's much more galactic in its tone, um, and it's a lot more comedic. And it's o- o- overtly comedic. Um, the director who also co-wrote it is, you know, is 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 makes comedies basically. His background is in comedies. Um, if you've seen Hunt for the Wild of People or um, we, what we do in the shadows, you'll you'll know that. And he voices the character you're talking about, Phil. Um, and he is a very funny guy. Uh, and I think. Uh, is a Kiwi, and, and I think just the Kiwi accent inherently is quite funny, um, but he's also very funny in the film. Um, and yeah, I, I, I my audience was, um, the audience I was with, it was also a pack screening, and they loved it. There was lots of big laughs. Um, it's, just, it's just over two hours long. And in fact, you kept referring to it as an hour and a half, suggesting it went by a nice, brisk pace that you didn't even realise it was longer than it was. 
um, which is a nice change, like you say, from sitting in a film looking at watch, thinking, like, how long is this going to go on for? I want to get out. Um, so, yeah, I think it was well paced. Uh, the effects are great. The cast was fun. Everyone was having a good time. Um, there was some, yeah, I thought uh, Kate Blanchett was, was a great villain um, and um, looking good for her age, I have to say. And, uh, yeah, overall, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And like, it's like I say, there are lots of little nods and things in there that relate to other parts of the Marvel Universe or to the previous Thor films. So if you haven't seen all that, you're not necessarily going to get as much from it as perhaps you will if, you, if you're familiar with it and immersed in that world. But I think anyone can go along and see it and have a good time. And that's the main thing. I think it's fun, enjoyable, uh, and it doesn't take itself seriously at all. Did the big, plot, the best did the big plot hole not, not bother you? Uh, no, I, I think I could I could explain my way around that, um, and I can see why they did certain things for narrative reasons. Um, they want to get Thor into a specific situation in order to, for, for, um, for him to meet a certain character. I'm trying to avoid too many spoilers here, although all this stuff's in the trailers and in the posters, so I don't know if it's really a spoiler. Um, but yeah, like I say, I think it's enjoyable. It's fun. It doesn't take itself seriously. I'd give I'd probably give it an eight out of ten. Okay, I'll tell you what I, I was thinking while I was watching this. I was thinking tonally. This is what the Han Solo movie should be. Yeah. <laughs> we see now, that's interesting you say that, Phil, because I was thinking something very similar. I was thinking now they've got this director in who's got a very distinctive style and they've let him take that style across to a Thor movie. I mean, so this film is very, very different from the other two Thor movies, which were pompous and, and you know, self-important and, and a little bit silly, but not intentionally silly. Uh, he's realised that the character is inherently silly and he's, he's t- taking his own... Um, you know, style and, and humor, and injected it into a Thor story. Um, still kept it within the Marvel universe, and still made a film that you know relates to the other films, but has its own personality. And I think it really works. If they let, and I, and I thought that's what they were trying to do with the Han Solo movie by letting Lord and Miller inject their particular style into a Star Wars movie, but by bringing in, you know, by getting rid of them and bringing in Ron Howard, clearly they haven't done that. So yes, if they if they kept true to their as marvel have done obviously they've kept their nerve thought okay this is going to be a bit different but we think it's going to work and i think it has i think it's been well received it's doing well at the box office um i think if lucasfilm had kept their nerve in the same way i think they'd have a more interesting film but as it is yeah. uh, as we've discussed last week i've got absolutely no interest in the hands of the movie yeah i know uh, right so let's pick our film of the month now this is uh, <laughs> this this one's going to be really easy to uh, to sort out because all three of us are going to vote and even if one of us goes for the second movie that we've seen, <laughs> um, it would need both of us to do that to out- outvote Ed. So I think film of the month is going to be Blade Runner 2049. Well, I guess by the process of extraction that I have been to the cinema once. Yeah, I guess it has to be, doesn't it? Yeah, because even, 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 <laughs> even if Steve says Thor, he's outvoted now. So it is I've seen done. I've seen a film on Sky Movies that I thoroughly enjoy that I hadn't seen before, but I, I guess that doesn't necessarily count. No, so. this no, this is for what's at the cinema. Oh, uh, fine, okay. <laughs> so by the process, but uh, that also does mean that uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine was the worst film I saw this month as well. So you know, let's be be careful about this. Okay, uh, films opening this Friday, Steve. Uh, this Friday we have uh, not well. An interesting selection, I suppose. We've got A Bad Mum's Christmas, which is a sequel to Bad Mums, which actually I saw on the plane, I think when we were going to Vegas last year, and, and quite enjoyed. Um, so uh, this obviously is, uh, they turned in the usual thing where they've now got the the characters from the first film's mothers turning up, um, giving it a you know, sort of generational aspect. And obviously it's set to Christmas, so it's coming out in time for Christmas. A little bit earlier, I thought, really, just still a bit early for Christmas but anyway A Bad Mom's Christmas and also we've got Murder on the Orient Express which is the new film directed by Ken- directed by and starring Kenneth Branagh as Hercule Poirot and an all-star cast um, including Daisy Ridley nice to see her doing something other than Star Wars um, now uh, I'm not sure about this because I'm unless not, they've I'm changed the plot I, I, know, I know who the killer is because yeah. I've seen the original film so either they've changed the the plot, you know, and and the killer, some in some way, to make it interesting, or it's just going to be a question of watching something you already know what happens, and you know who done it. If you know who done it, that does kind of take away. It does the pleasure it? of the whole story. Yeah, at, at least um, at least with something like Titanic and that kind of thing, you can tell a story uh, uh, along with the factual events. You can add a bit of drama and dramatization and all that. You can't really change the plot of something that that's uh, so well known. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, they either do something controversial and change it entirely so that it's enjoyable to watch or it becomes an exercise in watching a remake with a, a modern starry cast and 
I mean, it looks gorgeous in the trailers, and you think, okay, it looks lovely, and it's got, you know, it's got an interesting cast. Although I must admit, the, the presence of Johnny Depp puts me off anything these days because I, I just can't buy Depp anymore. Um, but I don't know, I don't know. It's, uh, I might go and see it just out of curiosity, and and just uh, just just for the fact that we've got limitless cards and we need to. Well, yeah, exactly. It won't cost me anything. <laughs> Well, it is. It's, it's already costing you money, so you need to go to the cinema. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I don't know if I, I think I'd rather go and see that Geostorm than go and see that. <laughs> That's getting absolutely slammed, isn't it? I didn't realise how long it's been just waiting to be released, and then they chose the moment to release it when large swathes of America got hit by actual natural yeah, disasters. Yeah. 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 After two years of delays, they chose the wrong time. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, what's at the cinema. So let's go move on to Blu-rays of the month now. Once again, um, I want the disc that you're going to uh, talk about, Steve, but um, I wasn't quick enough with the pre-orders for the limited edition, and the only thing that was left was the Steelbook limited edition at 25 quid. I'm going to wait to November uh, for this disc to get its proper release, uh, its standard release. Um, but you're going to say it's Blu-ray of the month for this month because you were lucky enough to order it when you got the press release. That's what I feel, yeah. I got the press release um, from Arrow um, and they're bringing out its limited edition of one of my favourite films, which is The Thing. And I was straight on to Amazon as soon as that became available to order, I ordered it. Um, obviously, it did sell out fairly quickly. Um, as you point out, though, there will be a standard um, release um, in November. The difference is based by... I mean, the disc itself is identical. The only difference is that the special limited edition comes with uh, like a little book and some uh, lobby cards and that sort of stuff. So um, if you just want the film and the extras, then um, just you can wait till next month and get it for, um, I think it's about, what, 15, 16 quid? I've got, I've got to say, fantastic release from, um, I mean, this is the only Blu-ray I've bought this month, so by process of elimination, it was going to win anyway, but it is a cracking, cracking release from, from Ar- Ar- Arrow. Um, got the film from a brand new 4K restoration overseen by john carpenter and uh, dean cunney the, the director of photography it's got a whole new documentary tons of extras all the stuff's been released for plus new things um absolutely fantastic uh release uh, if you're a fan of the film you'll, you'll be in hog heaven and uh, it looks gorgeous on disc it's uh it's yeah i can't recommend it highly enough um i think i honestly think that the thing is a classic uh i think it's john carpenter's best film and uh yeah i recommend it highly so if you, if you haven't got it yet obviously you can't buy the limited edition one because that's sold out I wouldn't recommend it unless you're a big Steelbook fan. I paid 25 quid on that, so just wait like Phil. And in a couple of weeks' time, you can pick it up um, as a regular release. And I think I think it's uh, 13.99 as well, which is good value oh, well, for money. Go. So there Get you go. In. You know what I mean? Um, well worth it. And I think I've done a, a, a brilliant job uh, for the feedback I've read so far on this. Um, and it was with Carpenter and the director of photography. So yeah. you can say that this is the definitive uh, version. Um, yes, so. one, one can only hope that at some point we get a 4K release as well. Yeah, that would be that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Maybe. Uh, right, so if people are still buying uh, Blu-rays, Steve, what can they buy this week? There's quite a lot out this week, actually. We've got um, Transformers, The Last Night. Um, obviously, that's also available on 3D Blu-ray and also on 4K um, Blu-ray as well. Um, now, not a great film, but it is a very good-looking disc, I have to say. Um, the Ultra HD Blu-ray has Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos, so if you're uh, if you're that way inclined... It's certainly uh, certainly a good-looking disc. It does change aspect ratio, which is bloody annoying. Um, but if you've got a projector and you can mask it, you can sort that out. Uh, but yes, a cracking-looking disc, cracking-sounding disc, but obviously not a great film. We've also got It Comes at Night. Now, this is kind of a horror film, but maybe not exactly a horror film. Um, but certainly an interesting film. Um, I haven't seen it, but we reviewed it when it came out at the cinema. And uh, and yes, it, it's, been, uh, it's been getting a lot of attention because it... I think it was promoted in one way, but actually it's a slightly different thing than people are expecting. Um, a bit like Mother in some respects, which was promoted as a horror film, but definitely isn't. And this is probably more than just a horror film, but certainly an interesting uh, idea with an interesting cast and worth checking out. We've got The Villainess, which is a South Korean movie shot in a combination of uh, normal um, normal style and also POV. So it's a bit like watching someone playing a video game in some respects where you get third person and then first person aspects. Um, but apparently the action scenes are absolutely amazing. Um, so uh, if you like action and career movies, um, this is definitely worth checking out. We've also got Batman, we mentioned at the beginning, Batman versus Two-Face, which is um, the final Batman performance by Adam West with William Shatner as well as uh, as Two-Face. So uh, so I think that's definitely worth it checking out. I know it's uh, they did one a, a couple of them last year, uh, um, which also uh, was, was with Adam West and Burt Ward. And that was apparently really good fun. Um, so it kind of keeps the campy style, but it also adds that aspect to it. It's kind of a knowing nod to it, which uh, 
It sounds quite appealing. We've got the uh, the Vietnam War the documentary just finished on BBC Four, so it's coming out on disc. And uh, I've got to say, I thought it was a fantastic documentary, incredible to watch, particularly when you hear the recordings from Johnson and from Nixon. So you can hear them. Yeah, what a two-faced bastard Nixon is, uh, was rather. Um, there's stuff where he, you know he's saying one thing, and they show him talking on TV. And then they have the recordings of what he was actually doing behind the scenes. And he is just such a lying two-faced bugger. Um, but that was a fascinating documentary. Um, and also we've got Hammer House of Horror, which of those of us of a certain vintage uh, will remember this. It was um, Hammer stopped film so, production. So just you then. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, it was 1980. It was a TV series. So 13 episodes. It was an hour long each episode. They were, But they were shot like movies. They were shot on 35 millimeter film. Uh, and the disc looks absolutely stunning. It was like, you know, some of the stuff, you know, shots of England in 1980, 79, 80 on lovely 35 millimeter film, you know, just looks so detailed and, and you know, it's like going back in time almost. Um, great cast. Peter Cushing's in there, of course, but it's got, the, you know, it's basically got some gore, some nudity, um, some fun stories uh, and a great cast. And uh, yeah, each each one's an individual story and they are they are quite good fun and some of them are genuinely quite scary too one of them about a doppelganger absolutely scared the shit out of me when i was a kid um so if you're if you remember that series or just want to check it out it's worth seeing it's uh, it's great fun and it's really really nice restoration i have to say they've done a good job there okay so uh let's move on swiftly to ultra hd blu-rays and uh let's do our, our uhd blu-ray of the month um and it's, it's quite a tough month to to pick uh, a favourite because t- we've had two all time classics released uh, both of which are picked up on UHD Close Encounters and ET uh, both of them look absolutely gorgeous they both sound great I, I know that uh, pe- some people were not happy they didn't have an Atmos or a, a DTSX uh, mix on that can't say it really um, annoyed me uh, because we didn't have that back in 77 when it was released and the, I'd say the 7.1 mix that is on there is is phenomenally good E.T. as well, sounded really, really good, looked amazing, both of them look really amazing, film grain is there, as you would expect it to be, uh, it, I'm so glad it hasn't been, they haven't tried to remove it, which they have done with one disc that's now been delayed to next year, we'll come on to that in a minute. So for me, I, I, it's a really tough call between those two, because the other discs I haven't seen yet, but I have seen the films. Can I have two? Yeah, go on. Okay. You run the podcast. It's not like, you know, <laughs> it's not like we can edit you out, is it? Yeah, well, but, but I, you know, I, I want it to sound like it, it could be a democracy. Right, so Close Encounters ET, I think it's a, it's a joint first place for both of those. Um, you know, both Spielberg classics, uh, they look absolutely gorgeous uh, on 4K UHD. Go get them uh, if you haven't already got them. And uh, the, the other one, which isn't on uh, our list for this month but it's a, it's been out for a while but it's one that I bought in a two for £30 offer and I hadn't seen the film and I, I have been wanting to see the film for a while because I did listen to the soundtrack for quite a bit and that was La La Land wasn't sure whether I was going to like it or not I absolutely fell in love with that film that is just that it just it worked for me I know some people do not like it um, I, know, I know there's 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 a 50-50 camp with this one. You either absolutely hate it or you absolutely love it. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, and I thought the two leads were excellent in it. And I liked the fact that it was bittersweet. It wasn't a, a, a total Hollywood uh, love fest. So I really enjoyed that. So if you haven't got that yet, and it looks sumptuous on, on UHD as well. Yeah. So uh, it's super wide. Yeah, 2.5. 255 five to 1, one yeah. yeah and, and they really push the colours to give that kind of Technicolor look, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does. It looks like an old MGM Technicolor musical. It really does. Fantastic, absolutely. But it's got that modern twist to it, which I really liked as well. So if you haven't picked up that disc yet, do that. So my two for the month are Close Encounters and E.T. Steve? Yeah, I mean, Close Encounters, awesome. You know, 4K restoration. E.T., same 4K restoration. So you're getting a full 4K image from 35 millimeter negative. Uh, looks, they both look fantastic. Wonder Woman um, is a good-looking disc as well and sounds great. And, and I think it's a fun movie. Transformers, not so much a great movie, but it's certainly a good-looking disc and a great-sounding disc as well. Uh, and my probably my choice just to be different um, this month is going to be, I mean, although I've had it since July, <laughs> but it finally came out in the UK this month, Fast and Furious 8, oh, um, which is a Dolby Vision DTSX uh, disc. And, um, yeah, uh, it looks great, and I, and I really enjoy the film. So, when, you when you pick stuff like that, your credibility just goes out the window. <laughs> you know that? You do, you do realise that? I, I didn't know I had any credibility. <laughs> well, there is that as well, isn't there? Right. Um, so... <laughs> There you go, that's our picks. Um, there's some really, really good discs out there at the minute uh, on UHD Blu-ray, so if if you've just got yourself a 4K TV or you just got yourself a player, there's loads of for you to go and get that are absolutely stonking. And uh, it looks like up to the end of the year there's some there's still some really good stuff coming along as well, Steve. 
There is. I mean, announcements in terms of new stuff coming out. We've got American Made, which we both saw at the cinema and actually, to our surprise, rather enjoyed. That's coming out on the 5th of December, in the US at least, and that's going to be a Dolby Vision disc. And also on the 18th of December, that's in the UK, 19th in the States, uh, Dunkirk is going to be getting its Ultra HD Blue. I mean, now, we knew they were going to be coming around about that time because obviously, as I mentioned last week, uh, Warners are releasing um, the Batman trilogy, the Dark Knight trilogy. Have, you, have um, you seen that there's actually going to be a Nolan box set? Now, I don't know if it's going to be US or UK, but there certainly is one being released that has all these films on UHD. Oh, well, that'd be good. So what, like Insomnia and Inception as well? Yeah. Okay, well, I would be up for that. And and also Paramount uh, Warners, I think they did together. So Interstellar is coming out as well. Um, so given that he does use IMAX on some of those uh, scenes, on it, various scenes of some of those films, and also Dunkirk was shot entirely on IMAX 65mm, um, you know, these are going to be some cracking looking discs. And I think Dun- Dunkirk should look absolutely amazing. So that's a major title. Um, but, but bringing out all of his other films at the same time is... It should news. also sound astonishing. Yes. I, I remember how blown away I was at the cinema with, with the sound design. It's very, very clever. Very clever. So I think that's a, a title I'm really looking forward to. Dunkirk, 18th of December. And then the other news, um, and not a massive surprise given that the stuff that's been flying around recently, is that Terminator 2, which has been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, has now been delayed until next year. Um, because apparently they screwed up the, the disc and, and have used... Um, so the, the film was restored, obviously, and, and released at the cinema. You saw it in 3D. Yep. And they've used the 3D master as the basis for the for the 2D disc release, and it and it looks terrible with excessive um, uh, smoothing and you know edge enhancement and noise reduction and all this sort of stuff going on, uh, which obviously was done for for a reason for the 3D release, but would never have been should never be used for the 2D release. And, and, and I don't know whether Cameron's real you know got involved with hang on a minute because <laughs> he is a, a techno you know he's a, a full technophile he knows what he's doing, so um, it looks like this has been delayed to do to redo the disc properly. Um, which I think is good news. I, I'd rather have, I'd rather wait and get it properly, than have a half-assed release that looks terrible. Yeah, I, I know a, a, a few people, certainly somebody I follow on, on Facebook and who writes for a set magazine, um, got a screener through and, and it looked atrocious. He put a few screen grabs up and it, my god, it looked terrible. Um, so I'm so glad that that has been withdrawn um, and that they're going to read. Well, we're assuming that they're going to read it, um, but yeah, yeah, I think you can safely say that that is the reason it's been pulled. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm expecting this to look stunning, and and I think that's that's the problem. There's a certain expectation here. You know, it's Cameron, it's 4K. That they've done a full 4K restoration, the usual camera negative. You know, you expect the best from this man, and I think he knows that. Um, hopefully, we'll see, in next year we'll see this released. Plus, I'm fingers crossed that uh, the Abyss, which I noticed has popped up on Netflix, so I'm really hopeful that the Abyss is finally going to get a disc release of some sort um, next year as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like I said, I would rather wait. It's, I mean, it's, the funny thing is, I was going to say, the funny thing is, we've had so much debate recently about film grain. You mentioned it when you were talking about Close Encounters and ET, uh, and it's supposed to be there. And if you try and remove it, this is what you end up with. You end up with these plasticine-looking faces smoothed out and everything's ruined, and it's meant to be there, and you can't just remove it uh, and not change the look of the film. I was reading an article, I bought Barry Lyndon on Blu-ray, um, and as, a, as an interview with the director of photography talking about shooting the film, because obviously it was shot using natural light. It was famously shot um, using candlelight and really, really fast lenses they got off NASA. Um, but he's talking about using film stock and saying you know, there was this uh, two types of Kodak film stock and the new film stock had come out just after they finished shooting the film. He said, but I wouldn't use it anyway, he said, because uh, it was, it, there, there was almost no grain in the film. And I want that grain. <laughs> I, 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 it was just, it was, doesn't look like film anymore. It was, it was too fine. Um, so it's interesting that even back in 70. Four seventy-five. There was debate about the level yeah, of film. Yeah, it, it, it's always when we get new formats. I mean, it was the same with, with DVD. It was the same with Blu-ray, um, and we finally, you know, th- those arguments died away eventually. That you know, uh, film grain supposed to be there, uh, and then you get four K come along, and it really does show up the grain four K resolution. Um, if if you HD up, especially like you say with HDR and your regrade and stuff and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, it, it's supposed to be there. Um, it's not noise, as people describe it. It is not noise. It is part of uh, the film, the makeup of the film, and it's supposed to be there. And some films will be worse than others. And uh, and some directors deliberately pick really cheap film stock, or or they have their hands tied, a, a la Danny Boyle with Train Spotting, 
you know, they used really, really cheap film stock for that film, and it shows. There's never been a nice transfer of that film because it'll never look nice. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to look gritty and grainy, and that's why he chose really bad film stock because he wanted that really, really rough look to images. And it, and it's an artistic choice, and it's like coming back to that Blu-ray player, LHC Blu-ray player that you're reviewing, Steve. It, it's not up to a manufacturer to say how something should look and it's not up to the end user to say how something you now you can use personal preference if you want nobody's going to stop you it's your own home it's your own equipment and all the rest of it i would have thought that the vast majority of people want to see these things as they're supposed to be seen and that includes film grain that includes what some people would call call noise if you look at certain films the way that they're blowing out such as um war of the worlds spielberg's version yeah, yeah. um you know It'd that contrast that deliberately blows out all the highlights um, and and the blacks are grey. It's deliberate. It's it's done that like like that. So it's an artistic choice. So I know we keep coming back to this, but I just think it's every time we get a new format where it ups the resolution and green becomes more visible and more visible. But I think we're actually at the point now where it's not going to get any more visible than it is now at 4K. It's sad that we have to keep coming back and keep uh, reminding people why that that's there and, and these arguments keep coming up. Keeps the forums busy, but at the same time, it's like having the same argument every ten years. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll be interested to see what the comments we get when Mother gets released because uh, when I saw that at the cinema, I immediately thought it's a very grainy image. Um, you know, for a modern film, you, you cannot expect it. It was shot in sixteen mil, <laughs> and, and it is yeah. noticeable as soon as the film was subject. I thought that doesn't that looks different. Why does that look different? And then I looked afterwards, and I came out of the movies, and, and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, it was shot in sixteen mil. That explains why there's a lot more grain structure to it than there is normally. Yep, okay. Uh, right, so uh, moving on swiftly, TV shows of the month. There's quite a bit to pick from for Steve because I haven't seen anything. Have you, Ed? Um, I don't think I've watched, started watching anything new. Uh, all I would say is 7th of November, uh, Steve will like this as well, Master Jeff the Professional starts again. One of my TV highlights of the year. What a program, especially the heat stages where you get some delusional self-trained bell end. That's... <laughs> top quality viewing so um i'm looking forward to that otherwise i've just been listening to music because I'm, I'm i'm hip to be square okay uh i guess it's up to you steve yeah well uh my choice of the month is definitely going to be mind hunter which i think i mentioned last week uh I, it's uh well it's the first two episodes and the last episode is directed by david fincher he's also executive producer along with shalice theron but it's based upon the true story of the early days of the behavioral science unit at the FBI and their hunting, how they developed uh, techniques for hunting serial killers. And it's absolutely fascinating. It's beautifully shot. It looks stunning in Dolby Vision. It's got a great cast. Uh, it's a largely unknown cast. Um, Anna Tor's in it, who was in Fringe, but it's it's, it's not a, a starry cast at all, but uh, a really good cast. And uh, I, I absolutely I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was superb. Um, also, been running in the last month or so we've got the deuce which is the new series from david um david simon 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 david david simon david simon um no simon david uh who did wrote, wrote the <laughs> wire remember, yeah it's simon, it's, it's simon i hate these first you these suck, names of, steve <laughs> simon david i think you saw it it's nice david. to see we do a research on these things yeah. um who did the wire and it's about the early days well i suppose i suppose about the early days of the porn industry in new york but four episodes in and so far no one's shot a porn film so uh it's taking its time to get there um but it's got a great cast <laughs> david <laughs> it's got a great cast james franco and maggie Ginn and hal and um yeah that, that looks they've really nailed the 70s um uh, uh look and uh period detail absolutely brilliantly also out um Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, the ninth season of Larry David's um, groundbreaking comedy series, which is as funny as I th- ever. I thought it was uh, cancelled. No, no. Mm-hmm. They just had a hiatus. I suppose he All right. didn't break. But uh, it's really, really funny. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and, and still pushing boundaries and, and really getting away with murder. Uh, so if you like Curb, then check that out. Also, uh, Walking Dead started again. After a very difficult seventh season where I, I found the film, I almost stopped watching it because I was getting sick of Negan and, and everyone getting basically put down and tortured and hassled. Uh, now it's just all out war. So um, I'm hoping season eight is going to be a lot more fun. Uh, and uh, we you know, see lots of, lots of, um, lots of action, basically. Uh, also, as I mentioned, Vietnam War. That was a great series. And of course, just started available to stream as of 8 a.m. this morning and the day we're recording on the Friday, Stranger Things 2. Right, so have you watched it? 
I watched the first two episodes. Um, oh, it's, okay. it's I only started streaming at eight, so and we're recording at ten. So I've squeezed in as much as I could. <laughs> okay, I'm impressed in in some yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, and I obviously don't want to give away anything, so I'll keep this spoiler free. Um, what I can say, is obviously, for those of us who were around in the 80s, uh, um, Stranger Things was um, last year, when it came out last year, was a huge surprise and a nostalgic treat because it wears its influences on its sleeve. So for those of us who you know who remember going to see The Goonies and E.T. and, and Poltergeist and, you know, um, It, I'd forgotten actually until I saw It again at the cinema last month, just how how much Stranger Things owes that particular film or story rather book in terms of its influences. But, you know, the idea of the gang of kids on their bikes investigating some paranormal event, government conspiracies, all the things that they threw into it. Uh, but whilst it was nostalgic, it was also enjoyable and fresh and new in its own way. And um, I'm pleased to say that so far, at least uh, Stranger Things 2, because they do kind of treat them as films. I mean, Stranger Things is a film. It's a long film. It's an eight hour film, but it's a film. Stranger Things 2 is, is a sequel, and it's a nine episodes, so a nine hour sequel. Um, but they've, yes, they've retained everything that we love about the first series, and they've just kind of expanded it. So there are things that take place outside of Hawkins this time, it was mostly, I think it was all in one town before. They've added some new characters, which are interesting. Um, there's some new people in the cast. So Sean Astin's in the cast now, who was in The Goonies. Obviously, he's also Sam in um, Lord of the Rings, but he was in The Goonies. So that's quite good having him in it, along with Winona Riders. And um, and they've also got Paul Reiser in it, who everyone will remember is Burke in Aliens. So even though he seems to be playing a nice character so far, I'm suspecting he'll be shifty later because he does shifty very well. <laughs> I listened to the soundtrack earlier this week. I wasn't quite so taken with that. I mean, I, it struck me much more that this was that this was music for specific instances in the film. The first one soundtrack sort of held together as an actual piece of music, you know, watched without context or listened without context. This seemed to be much more sort of segments for specific instances in the in the program. But you know, again, good good sort of you know modern take on an 80s synth soundtrack you know very heavy leanings to the john carpenter end of things so yeah. yeah that's that's out for people to enjoy as well we'll see if it gets a thoroughly gratuitous final release as well i was gonna say it's good to see that the uh, the kids obviously because the big problem with a, a series based around children is they grow up and they've done this fast enough that they still look the same as they did last year roughly um uh, and they've uh, obviously they're, they're still into playing their video games in the arcade and uh and dressing up in Ghostbusters outfits for Halloween. So it, it, that's quite good. Um, the sheriff is still there smoking way too much. As, again, as you can see some casual smoking going on. Um, Winona Ryder still looks completely bonkers. Uh, so everything as it should be, I think. Um, they still need to give uh, give Nancy some food because the girl looks thin. And Steve's hair is massive still. So it's all good. Uh, and it looks stunning in Dolby Vision, I have to say. The upside down in particular, where you've got those bits floating in the air and stuff, really get picked out by the peak highlights. It's, uh, it's a, it looks gorgeous. Um, and um, yeah, so far, excellent. And I'm really looking forward to, to thrashing my way through the rest of it over the weekend. Okay, that, that's cool. And uh, the problem with your next bit on the running order, Steve, is that people will be listening to this on Monday. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and most of the Halloween will have happened over the weekend, trick, trick or treating and so on. But if people uh, do want to belatedly celebrate Halloween, although they have got, you know, if they listen to us on Monday, they've got Tuesday to do it. Uh, what can they watch? Because basically, I'm yeah, not. Ha- technically, Halloween is the 31st, right? So it's yeah, Tuesday. It so is, yeah. it. It's just everything happens over this weekend that we're recording. So, um, But anyway, I'm not a horror fan. I won't be watching any horror. I don't like Halloween either. I'm, not, I'm a non believer. <laughs> is there a belief system attached to Halloween? I think it's just an excuse to dress up and get to tweet. Or it is now. Now the Americans have got, you know, we adopt, adopt, you know, adopted American pastimes so much. Uh, actually, I should be holding my Halloween celebrations next weekend on the 4th to tie it in with some firework action at the same time. Um, but I am planning to watch uh, The Thing, obviously, and also An American World from London. That's my two films that I've got lined up for Halloween. Good for you, Ed. And Stranger, and Stranger Things, of course. I, horror as a category, can do one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. With you on that one. Um, I probably have to go trick or treating at some point because my son is determined to. Which, as you how, old, can, how old is he now? Four. God. Which you can, you know, you can detect from the tone of my voice. I'm just, you know, falling over myself to do. So, you know, I'm looking forward. Well, it to means that. you have to interact with other people, which you're not. It does, enjoy. which obviously I don't enjoy. So, you know, that's that's all all, all by the by. But 
uh, no, I mean, program wise, no. I mean, I, my wife will, will get stuck into Stranger Things 2 in the fullness of time. Um, and I'll probably, you know, watch, bit, watch bits of it, but no. Um, I suppose I ought to think about something spooky to listen to instead, but I haven't got that far yet, so I'll work out from there. I might give Thriller a good spin. Yeah, I was going to say, awesome. Thriller seems the obvious choice. Yeah, yeah. It, it just uh, it, it just struck me there that Will came into being in the first weeks of this podcast. That shows you how long we've been doing this weekly podcast. Yes, I was just I was thinking something. I was thinking, God, is he four? Is it been four years? Yeah, four yes, years of doing uh, this weekly podcast. Yeah, he is. Um, I mean, I, I struggle with it as well. Don't worry. <laughs> I live with him on a daily basis. <laughs> but yes, he is he is now. He was four earlier in the month, and I've been looking at schools and all sorts of stuff, and it's just making me feel old. And as you know, I'm recoiling and looking at Volvos because you know <laughs> my, my, li- my life is over uh, as best as I can work out. So I might as well have a very comfortable, safe <laughs> car. And once again, we managed to end the podcast on, on a thoroughly depressing note. Um, my thanks to Steve Brothers. I don't give a crap if you cover yourself in peanut butter and had a 15-hooker gangbang. And Ed Sally. Key to that chain is in the bathtub. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmark every forum so there's reviews, news and videos, and of course you can leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. I'm Phil Hinton, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again for episode 199 next week. (laughs) 